I'm Corey Johnson and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Snapchat wins over Wall Street, but what's the real reason analysts are suddenly so bullish about Snap stock? Plus, Facebook's WhatsApp creates pressure to create a has, faces pressure to create a back door for intelligence officials. It's a new debate over privacy and encryption. And a self-driving car accident grounds Uber's fleet of autonomous cars, but now some of them are back on the road. But first, to our lead, some investors expected a rocky session for U.S. stocks Monday, fresh off the failed health care vote Friday. Let's bring in Bloomberg's stock reporter, Abigail Doolittle. So they finished today. Abigail, uh, there was a lot of prediction over the weekend that we'd see a really rough day of trading. What did you see? You know, Corey, we had a little bit of everything today. We had the worst open for the S&P 500 of the year. This, of course, followed the worst week for stocks last week. So a bit of bearishness there, and there were some expectations that we would see some strong selling. But then as the day progressed, we saw a bit of a recovery. The Nasdaq flipped into the positive territory. The Dow and the S&P 500 down ever so slightly. So at the end of the day, basically a mixed and unchanged close. It is worth noting, though, Corey, the Dow down eight days in a row, the longest bearish streak since April of 2011. So still some bearishness there. As for the Nasdaq and why the tech heavy index did finish modestly higher on the day, this was largely, uh, it largely came down to biotech. The biotech index was up more than 1% on the day, being helped by some of the big names, including Regeneron and Celgene. And these stocks, these companies aren't really affected all that much by the Affordable Care Act. So the fact that the Republicans failed to get that bill through last Friday, not too much of an impact. In fact, these stocks rallied last Friday, a rally again today. So perhaps just a little bit of relief overall. But the big story, as you know, Corey, though, related to the markets overall, the reflation trade. Is it coming to an end? And by the reflation trade, I'm talking about the big rally we've seen out of the election uh, on hopes that President Trump's policies will stimulate the economy. When we take a look at a five-day chart of the NASDAQ, we see that the NASDAQ is down about 1% over that time period. This could be the start of a reversal of that trade. Only time will tell. But you can see that jumpy, bumpy ride right in that chart there today. And of course, that really bearish open as well. I'm glad I was an airplane. We didn't have to watch the open this morning. <laughs> it's, it, it is interesting, though. It sort of makes a little bit of sense, even the, in the biotechs, too, because uh, and the Nasdaq, you know, not sort of participating in as much of a sell off because the suggestion is that the, the administration won't be able to get done all the things it wants to do as, if, if infrastructure and tax cuts are as hard to pull off as as a health care bill, then maybe all those changes to drug pricing won't happen. Maybe technology remains uh, un, unimpacted. True. That's an interesting point that you're making there, Corey. Only time will tell. I think, though, the uncertainty of the idea that this rally, these policies that investors have been banking on, I think that that's creating some of the volatility, but not a ton of volatility for the Nasdaq. When we go beneath the service, here are some of the biggest losers on the day, including Akamai, Intuit, Seagate, Xilinx. You can see the losses aren't that big, and there weren't really any fundamental causes that we were able to determine. Our markets team, Intuit was down, though, on a cut at Goldman Sachs to buy from conviction by the analysts there saying that it's going to be a more difficult tax consumer uh, environment. But the big winner on the day, the biggest point boost for the Nasdaq today, Corey, Alphabet shares rebounded in a big way. The first update in six days. Last week, these shares were down 4% on the concerns that big advertisers were pulling ads from Google or Alphabet's YouTube. But today, lots of analysts came out to support the shares of Alphabet, including Colin Sebastian over at Baird saying it's too early to panic. So that seems to be the consensus position of some of the analysts out there today. And Alphabet rallied on that defense from Wall Street, Corey. Yeah, I saw that. James Chalkmock, also our friend at Moness, uh, having similar comments that it's not that big a deal. Abigail do a little thank you very much. Are now staying with stocks in the midst of the market sell off. There was a night, uh, bright spot all day long. Shares of Snap were up. They closed up 5%. Snapchat's parent company, nine new buys after an initially cooler reception with analysts. The difference is that today's analysis comes from firms that received investment banking fees from Snap. Maybe just a coincidence. Maybe not. But currently, the company has 12 buys, 11 holds, and six sells. Joining us, one of those analysts who's giving Snap the benefit of the doubt, uh, Jason Helfstein. Joining us right now, MD at uh, Oppenheimer and Bloomberg Gaffley columnist, Cher Ovidier. Good to see you both. Uh, talk to me about your, your research here and what you decided about. So, you want to play good cop, I'll play bad cop? Or I can, we, well, we're, we're doing mean, we, we did come out with a perform rating, so, so not kinda, high. Yeah, 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 but yeah. we did give them a range of 21 Traffic to cop. 26. Right. So, we said we think it's worth 
to up to 26, but it, that's not enough for us to give it an outperform rating. So, so what is it that you think investors don't adequately appreciate about Snap? I'm not sure it's 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 that. Um, I mean, clearly the stock has performed well since the IPO. Investors do like it. I mean, this is a a very interesting company. Clearly pioneering. They have 75 percent of the uh, 18 to 24 year olds using the platform. There's a question though. Can you get everybody else? And right. we have done some work around that that we put in our report that we think was pretty insightful. Uh, but but really, if you look at the history of tech IPOs, um, they generally do come down after that initial IPO pop. And we think, while yes, there is a double digit gain from the, the share price today, we think uh, investors would be better off waiting for a lower price. Sure, you, you, you wrote a great piece today sort of looking at the, the analyst commu uh, community sort of en masse. Uh, the underwriters tend to be more bullish. They've, uh, I think you, you and Alex Brinko came with some great numbers showing us that the average uh, target price is much higher for the, the underwriting firms than the non-underwriting firms. What else did you find? Yeah, and it, it is interesting that now Basically, since the dot-com bubble, we have this pattern that uh, sometimes pops up, right, where the underwriter banks are, tend to be a little bit more bullish. So two-thirds, 69 percent of the underwriter, uh, the analysts at the underwriter firms were by ratings or the equivalent, and that compares with something like 14 percent of the analysts that were unaffiliated with the uh, underwriter firms. So that's a pretty big divergence of opinion let's and, say and, and 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 to be fair the, the you know there is a chinese wall there are legal requirements about the tell us how that works from from your perspective uh, at, at a company that's sure. ultimately underwriting and you're sure. trying to do the best research you can yeah so um, those firms who do participate in the deal do get uh, um, to um, to talk to the management they do get to be fair, more access. more access, right? And so, as a result, they may be able to form, form deeper opinions, get access to the management. Where typically the buy side. So, if you think about the way the roadshow works, the the company meets with the big investors, the mutual fund, the hedge funds, and they dig in. But they do not meet with the sell side right. firms who are not involved in the deal. So, effectively, the firms who initiate who are not involved with the deal do tend to have right. less of an opportunity to learn about the company. But within the firm, I wonder what it's like to sit in your chair and, and, and deal with those Chinese wall rules. I mean, look, we, you know, the rules are the rules. Um, you know, we get a prospectus. The company allows you to ask questions about what's in the prospectus. We do our own third-party research. We look right. at third-party data sources. We do survey work, and we go to the com we go to the company. We ask them to clarify things, and some things they'll be able to tell you, and some things they can't. When I, when, I was, uh, when I was on the buy side, my, one of the partners of my firm refused to ever meet with management. He was, was a short seller and refused to meet with management. Because whenever he met with management, he'd walk away thinking, yeah, he wasn't such a bad guy. He's not really trying to lie to me. He's not really, oh, that was an interesting thing I hadn't thought about. Just didn't want to have that, that influence. I would meet with management all the time because I would always try to get over that. But you know what you're describing is, is something we've seen for a long history of. We'll see if these analysts are right. I wonder when you, when you looked through the notes, did you see some thoughtful analysis? Well, you know, the interesting thing about Snapchat is that 10 people can look at the same set of facts about this company and come up with 10 different conclusions. Because you're talking about a company that is, I agree, interesting, really created a new way for people, particularly young people, to communicate. And it's, it's become addictive for that young set of people, the right. 18 to 24-year-olds. The, the big issue, though, is that this is a company with a scant track record of monetization, right? They've been selling advertising for it's two years or less than two years. Right. Yeah. It has negative gross margins. It has kind of a business model that we haven't really seen before. And so I, I, I don't really fault analysts for having kind of divergent views looking at the same set of facts here. And, you know, the people who are bullish, I think, are doing so uh, kind of extrapolating growth either in their ability to, to generate ad revenue per user or in their ability to go from teenagers and young adults to kind of a more right. mature audience. And, and, and you, you point out in your report that the API is opening up as something that could really accelerate something. To describe that. Correct. So basically, this is a way to buy uh, uh, automatically, programmatically. So up until now, the majority of the campaigns on Snapchat were effectively bespoke. You had to work with the company, with the ad agency. It was a lot of effort. Uh, what an API does, it allows you to basically uh, make an ad and the computer decides who it should target, when it should run. And if we look back to Facebook, they launched their API mid-2011. While it took several quarters, it accelerated their growth from roughly 20% to 80%. Okay. Right. When Twitter launched their API, they actually saw a benefit like one quarter later. 
um, Twitter's growth was decelerating and then kind of stabilized and reaccelerated. As far as we can tell, it's still early. They're probably not going to see a significant benefit in the first quarter from the API, which is why they talked in the prospectus about revenue being down in dollars sequentially. Right. But we are very excited about, about what happens. Remember, though, when Facebook launched, it was a direct response ad platform. And direct response sure. is typically seasonal to the first half of the year. Right. For Snapchat, it went right at brand. And brand tends we'll to be, be very back quarter. half. Exactly. That's fair. And so without kind of API, which does tend to bring in direct response, that that's you know it's a reason right. to be excited, but we don't know the timing yet. Jason, thank you for the great thank stuff. You. Uh, Jason Helfstein uh, joining us on this daily big report out, managing, managing director at Oppenheimer, sure of a day. Thank you very much as well from Bloomberg Headline. All right, coming up, we're going to talk to Siemens CTO Roland Bush on the German tech giant going digital. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV on the Twitter. Weekdays, 5 o'clock on the East Coast, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. Siemens is betting big on the U.S. The engineering behemoth Innovation Day kicked off on Monday. The company touted its push to uh, add to investments in the U.S., as well as an outlook for U.S. digital manufacturing. Since 2007, the German companies invested to get this $10 billion in U.S. software companies, and they promised another $2 billion in industry grants to academic partners in the U.S. in hiring at least 300 uh, veterans in the U.S. over the next three years. Joining us right now an exclusive interview with Siemens Global CTO Roland Bush, the company's R&D labs in Princeton, New Jersey. Roland, talk to me about this effort. How is Siemens going to look different from, tell me what it looked like five years ago, what's going to look different five years from now? Well, what we do see is that digitalization is really changing all the uh, industries which you're working in. It's changing the energy sector, it's changing manufacturing, it's changing the way how mobility is going, but also the healthcare system. So um, it will drive productivity, flexibility, time to market, and this is where we are heavily investing. You talked about 10 billion investment. This is where investment goes. Um, so when you look at the, the possibilities here, I mean, I, I think that one of the most interesting things about this era of technology is that, you know, if you look back and say the dot-com era, that was about technology for technologists. But this is when technology is just changing everything, whether it's all the way down to the consumer or certainly with throughout the enterprise. Are there particular areas that you feel like this new digitization is going to help Siemens change a, a business operation? Yeah, I mean, as I said, it's, uh, it's the whole nine yards of uh, the markets which we're covering, but let me give an example on manufacturing. So what we do is, actually what you want to do is you would drive productivity in manufacturing and you would shorten your time to market. We do that in really creating a digital twin of your products as well as your manufacturing sites. So you can simulate the product as well as how you manufacture it. Um, you run your, all your cycles and once you're ready, then you can download all this software to your real world, to your automation device it, and run it. You can skip A and B samples, go for a quick C sample and shorten your time to market and drive efficiency and productivity at the same time. So this is really, really when digitalization and domain know-how meet each other and create value for the customers. Is rapid prototyping about that 3D printing, or is that, uh, you know, I, I look at that as a technology that's been vastly overhyped, but it is very interesting. Absolutely. So rapid prototyping, 3D printing, is something which helps you in that phase, so that you, if you really want to make a quick try on what you're doing, what you want to produce, you can do that. But it helps you also um, in the way how you prepare for spare parts, for example. And some parts, and we don't talk really big volume, but some special parts you can design only um, in, in, a, in a new way if you use 3D printing and that opens you a completely new area. For example, the, the burner of a gas turbine, we can really change the design and increase the efficiency of a turbine in using 3D printing. And, and let me ask you finally about robotics. Uh, talk to me about the importance of robotics in, in, the, in Siemens processes. So robotics, and we do not talk about the heavy lifting robots, which you see currently in automotive manufacturing. We talk about really robots which are smaller, which have sensors, which have vision, visionary capabilities, which would uh, replace some manual work. This is what we talk about when we talk about um, autonomous robotics or the future of robotics. And they would really go into the manufacturing process and really drive productivity there as well. That's where we are active with our automation devices, our software as well. 
and, and we are working together with customers to see how we can help them really driving and optimizing their process lines and using these robots. Yeah, it does seem like we're seeing a really rapid innovation there. It's not just going to be Roombas running around uh, picking up lint balls. So Siemens Global CTO, Roland Bush, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, coming up, another week, another controversy to Uber. The backlash for recent crash in Arizona that put the company's self-driving program on hold. And a reminder, check out our interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live, see old interviews, or dive into the socks we talk about, or Bloomberg functions we talk about. That's for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check out TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Well, Amazon's futuristic new grocery store, not quite ready for prime time. The public opening of Amazon's first cashier-free convenience store has been delayed due to technical complications, according to the Wall Street Journal. The store, called Amazon Go, uses machine learning and cameras to detect what's in your cart and automatically charge your Amazon account. Amazon Go is supposed to launch at the end of this month, but after beta testing began last December, the technology is reported having some trouble keeping track of more than 20 people at a time, and it struggles to track an item that's been moved uh, from some place on a shelf. Right, Uber's self-driving cars are back on the streets of San Francisco. The move comes just three days after a crash in Arizona put the company's testing program on hold. According to police, one of Uber's self-driving SUVs, a Volvo to be specific, was involved in a high-impact crash but another vehicle caused that accident. But this is just the latest controversy the company is facing. Uh, Eric, newcomer, is getting used to telling us about these controversies. Uh, Eric, so uh, this, this seemed pretty freaky initially, just any accident with a self-driving car, even when there's a person in it uh, who's uh, there to, to act as a sort of a safety, is disconcerting. Yeah, it's pretty terrifying to see a self-driving car tipped over you know, in the road. So I think anybody who saw that was definitely nervous. Um, now, as we've learned more about it, it seemed like the uh, Uber's vehicle wasn't responsible. The other vehicle uh, failed to yield, so that's why they're, they're getting back onto the road. See, I would argue it's more terrifying to see a self-driving car actually moving on the street. Maybe that's why the driver was so distracted. I saw this freaky car and drove <laughs> plowed into it. <laughs> Maybe, I don't, I don't know. I, this, this sort of plays into the whole self-driving argument, right? I mean, we've got these crazy human drivers out there just ramming into self-driving cars. We need perfect machines to do it so this doesn't happen anymore. I think that would be the, the Uber spin on this. So I was with a venture capitalist yesterday. We were, uh, we were in an Uber, actually, and we were having this conversation about sort of imagining how self-driving cars might roll out. If you figure, say, 15 million cars to so 12 million cars sold in an average year, and then you figure how many of these might be self-driving at a certain price point in how many years, to get to that point where most cars are self-driving, would take decades and decades if the technology ever could even get to work. Right, I mean, there's gonna have to be a lot of collab or sort of coexistence, I guess is the right word, between human drivers and self-driving cars for a long time. Uh, like you said, the replacement cycle alone uh, will take quite some time and then getting the technology ready to where you could actually have cars without any human drivers present still seems a pretty long way off. You know, I, people talk about sort of maybe we'll need sort of particular cities to try it and actually build the infrastructure so the self-driving cars can interact with the roads, stoplights, and everything else. So it seems like the actual rollout here is still some time off, but uh, clearly Uber is aggressively uh, testing and seeing where this can work. And it's sort of amazing that they're not back up in Phoenix, but they are back up in San Francisco where they've been clashing with lawmakers in the state and, uh, in a very public way. Well, they're, they're going back up everywhere now. They gone back in San Francisco where it was just a test, whereas in Arizona and uh, Pittsburgh, they're doing sort of actual passenger trips. And of course, all these vehicles have two human drivers in the front, you know, one uh, ready to take the wheel and the other sort of monitoring what the car sees about the world, and in some cases helping with lane changes. Yeah, no, we, I don't, have you seen them in the streets of San Francisco? There was one parked in front of the San Francisco Bureau, and I snapped a picture and put it on my Instagram account. I don't know if they knew where they were, but uh, it, they're, they're sort of amazing to see. Yeah, I mean, when they were uh, f first launching in San Francisco, before they got kicked out, I went on a ride for one of, in one of them, and there were lots of human interventions, and I certainly see them around sort of mapping and sort of getting a sense of the, the landscape and taking all these 
sort of LIDAR pictures to understand what the world looks like and what the environment they're going to be driving in looks like. And let me ask you really quick, uh, do you get a sense that after all of these uh, 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 PR problems, that the company's responses become more grown up uh, in, in the way that they respond to these things that can make Uber look bad? I think they were smart to take the cars off the streets, you know, figure out what had happened, and then once they realized that they weren't at fault, redeploy. So it was a mature response. Uh, every scandal requires a different response. And I think a lot of their PR problems have been more substance than the optics. So right. in this case, it wasn't too bad. Well, and, and to be clear, what matters is the substance, not the optics. Although, right. when you've got this, you know, the hashtag delete Uber or whatever that, that uh, campaign was about, that, that optics led to a, a substantial problem. Yeah, I mean, in the delete Uber case, though, the, I, I think we both agree that some of the, the story behind the protests and everything like that is suspect. But the underlying issue, the closeness to the Trump administration, I think people were expressing dissatisfaction with the company on that front, and that's what really brought about Delete yeah. Uber. Uh, Eric Newcomer, Bloomberg Technology Reporter, who covers Uber for us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Right, coming up, tensions between tech companies and the government officials rise as the UK's Home Secretary asks Facebook for a backdoor to data from WhatsApp. And after last week's deadly terror attack, the debate over encryption next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on Bloomberg Radio. You can listen to Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, RDO, tune in. Uh, in the U.S. on Sirius XM. We're all over the place. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. A British counterterrorism officer says police found no evidence Westminster attacker Khalid Massoud was associated with Islamic State or Al Qaeda. He also says Massoud was not a subject of interest for counterterror police or intelligence services before last week's attack. Meantime, Britain says a planned trip to Russia by Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson this week has been postponed. It says the trip is being delayed because a NATO foreign minister's meeting is being rescheduled. French presidential candidate Marine Le Pen says if France rejects her plan to pull the country from the euro currency, she will resign. Le Pen leads the polls ahead of the April 23rd and May 7th voting. She's planning a referendum on the euro if elected president and says, quote, if it's a no, I will go. After just one day, South Africa's president, Jacob Zuma, ordered finance minister Pravin Gordon to abort a week-long roadshow with investors in London and the U.S. The sudden move is raising concerns the embattled leader could be preparing to reshuffle his cabinet. And the EU has summoned an envoy from the Philippines to explain the latest rant by President Duterte. Duterte reportedly threatened to hang EU officials for opposing his moves to reimpose the death penalty. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Monday here in New York, 8.30 Tuesday morning already in Sydney. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Elisa. And already New Zealand is up and running. Been trading for about 30 minutes now, but looking kind of flat, very flat, in fact. Uh, here in uh, Australia, futures are pointing slightly up, while Nikkei futures are mixed. And at the open on the ASX, we're going to be keeping a close eye on Maya. This is a large retailer here. Uh, Ten percent of Maya shares changed hands in the final 30 minutes of trade on Monday, and it had a profound impact on the stock price, uh, shooting up by the most on record. Uh, the buyer of that that uh, a huge block of shares is still unknown, but is by law required to make an announcement within the next two days. So the market anticipating that very closely. Also anticipating the arrival in Queensland of Cyclone Debbie, or a hurricane as you call it in the United States, now a Category 4 storm with winds of up to 180 miles per hour near its core. Already uh, there have been evacuations. Miners in the region have shut down and 20,000 homes without power. That is due to hit the coast within the next three or four four hours. So watching that closely, I'm Paul Allen here in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. This is 
Bloomberg Technology, and I'm Corey Johnson. Well, we continue to watch the markets. U.S. stocks closing lower on Monday trading. It's the seventh day of losses after President Trump and House Republicans failed to pass a highly anticipated health care bill on Friday, of course. Worry is that the administration won't be able to get anything done after this. That being said, the tech-heavy Nasdaq, the tech-heavy Nasdaq, managing to outperform. Snap got a boost after picking up a handful of new buy ratings from analysts. That certainly helped those shares today, about 5%. Our British Home Secretary Amber Rudd says Facebook's WhatsApp messaging service should open its encryption to intelligence services. Newspapers reported that Khalid Massoud used WhatsApp shortly before beginning his terror attack in London last week. Now, it's not the first time the government's called to, for access to encrypted data of its customers. Last year, or I should say of corporate customers, last year, remember the FBI and Apple clashing over unlocking an iPhone tied to a terrorist attack in San Bernardino, California. And the FBI managed to unlock the phone without Apple's help. But messaging software is a little harder to crack. Joining us right now from Los Angeles, Michael Zwayback, partner at Alston Bird's privacy and data security practice. Uh, Michael, talk to me about the, the, the desire of governments to get into this messaging stuff. WhatsApp seems to be especially architected to make that impossible. Well, what they're trying to do is uh, the specifically uh, both in the United States and in Europe, they've been trying to deal with the issue of whether or not they should legislate uh, some type of fix to require companies to install some form of backdoor into the technology. But of course, that's raised serious questions on the part of the technology manufacturers about whether a backdoor is truly safe and does that leave their, uh, their clients vulnerable to other uh, malicious actors out there um, and, and this is a serious problem. Uh, it, it seems that uh, whenever there's an attack like this in the government, the parts of governments, whether it's in the UK or here, are ready to get right out and say, hey, this is why we need uh, access to, to, to things that are secret. This is why we need a backdoor into a, whether it's a hardware device or a software device. But they're ready with that argument real quick because they've lost the argument uh, in, in, the, in the course of public conversations about this. Well, they're always ready with the argument real quick, but when you get down into the details, of course, that's where uh, things start to bog down. The fact of the matter is, is that companies have gotten a lot better uh, about data in motion, like WhatsApp, where you're talking about messaging information that is going from a software application from one device to another. Um, but, but the issue of what, when you actually are able to get into the phone and actually get this information that may be sitting at rest, similar to what was going on with the Apple phone in Riverside, there are certain technologies that may exist that may not be quote unquote back doors, but may give access to defeat certain uh, password defeating technologies that would allow law enforcement actual access to the data that is stored within the phone. The interception of that information that's in route is a much different question right. and a much more daunting question. Well, there's this new technology, this thing, what's it called? It's, um, oh yeah, it's called a warrant from a judge that exists as a matter of yes. law, both in the UK and here. <laughs> that doesn't seem to come into the discussion at all. Well, it doesn't because what you're talking about in the UK circumstance is a situation where it's a national security investigation. And in those types of contexts, they may not be seeking sort of Fourth Amendment or equivalent due process to get access to the information. They're looking at it from purely an intelligence perspective, not something that ultimately may end up being used in court, especially like here where the individual is now deceased. What they're interested in is what does it provide in terms of leads to other individuals who may have been involved in the particular case. Now, in other contexts, of course, the warrant is a very, very uh, critical tool that um, in, the, in the FBI versus Apple case where they were looking for other individuals and ultimately did prosecute someone. But even in that context where the Fourth Amendment, you know, where there's a Fourth Amendment order doesn't necessarily mean that that type of technology exists to bypass some of the mechanisms that exist nowadays to get access to that information. Yeah, it seems that co consumers certainly want privacy and it seems that that's where the market's gonna go. Uh, Michael's way back, uh, in great, interesting stuff, great conversation, we appreciate your time. Michael's way back is at Alston and Bird's Privacy and Data Security Practice, joining us from LA. At the latest tech revolving door of Facebook, hiring a 15-year Apple veteran to run its Oculus VR hardware division. 
Michael Hillman held senior, senior engineering roles and design roles at Apple. He's the head of hardware at Oculus now, though. Hillman's going to set the agenda for the consumer product strategy, trying to take virtual reality hardware mainstream. That's after Facebook hired another big name recently, former Xiaomi executive Hugo Barra, is going to oversee all of Facebook's virtual reality products. Well, still to come, Elon Musk and the unfathomable launch of Model 3. We're going to talk to a believer, Morgan Stanley's Adam Jonas. He's going to talk about Tesla's production goals next. Plus, what some are calling the Wright Brothers moment for SpaceX. If it goes well, this rocket will see space for the second time in its life. We're going to explain why that's a big deal next. This is Bloomberg. All right, to say that Tesla CEO Elon Musk has set a high bar for the launch of the mass market Model 3 is probably an understatement. In order to hit us all the targets, Tesla needs to build 430,000 Model 3s by the end of next year. It has yet to build one. It's more than all of the electric cars sold on the planet last year. Our next guest is quite bullish. Stocks up 50% since the beginning of December. He expects another 15% on top of that. Morgan Stanley analyst and global head of auto research, Adam Jonas, joins us right now with more. Really glad you're on, Adam. Uh, I follow this company it. really closely. You can follow it even more closely. Um, uh, talk to me first about the Model 3. I mean, it, th this seems like it is the biggest thing for this company flat out. When do you expect it to actually shift and what price do you think it's going to be? So uh, our forecasts are, are far more conservative than the company's forecasts, both this year and next. Uh, we, we expect this vehicle goes into kind of a soft launch mode into the fourth quarter this year. And uh, our forecast is for 2,000, not, not 20,000, not tens of thousands, but 2,000 units delivered at the end of this year. Uh, that's, that's, pretty, that's, that's a very small above zero number. The point of this year is just to have those initial deliveries done to get the data and the initial feedback from, from the community. Next year, we're at about 80,000 units. So yes, they've talked about 400,000 or that kind of pace of production. We are nowhere near that. And even if you go out a few, other, few more years to 2020, uh, I believe our numbers right now are uh, less than half, maybe a third of what management has been implying they could do. So in, in spite of that, right. we, are, uh, we are constructive on the investment story. All right, so, the, so the, the price of the car, what do you think the price of the car is going to be? We have uh, used in our model an average transaction price of around sixty thousand dollars. So, I, I know there's been a lot out that's there. About the 35. That's not thirty-five. That's I'm not good at math, but that's more than thirty-five thousand. <laughs> it is. We think that the kind of people that will put in the order for that car, uh, they won't want the thirty-five thousand dollar version. Okay. Um, so while they technically could deliver that, um, we think once it's specced up uh, with the range and the performance and safety capabilities that the average customer will activate, very few customers will actually walk out the door at that entry level price. It's more of an, an advertisement. We think it's going to transact more like 60. So one of the things that struck me was after the, the, the acquisition of Solar City that, um, that the impact of the, 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 the bomb of Solar City's balance sheet or cash flow statement was really going to hit the cash flow burning Tesla in a bad way. And they, we certainly saw that in the first quarter. How do you expect that to moderate? Uh, well, that's going to be up to them to prove, right? So they have acquired a cash, another cash-consuming uh, operation, and one with a, a fairly sizable balance sheet as well. Okay, which which adds even more financial leverage to the story. And a lot of investors, understandably, thought, you know, we didn't sign up for this. And so for throughout the summer, uh, and and we were also on the sidelines as well during that time as we digested it. Um, right now, we have, uh, we, we, I'd say we have the cash consumption of that business in, uh, in our medium term forecast. We have zero value of Solar City or Tesla Energy for that matter in our base case right now. We still value the company on, as entirely on a, well, but, uh, as a transportation but company. But you've got, you've got battery sales in your model going out and growing, and that battery business hasn't been working very well yet. Um, and, and I, you know, where's the, where's the give and take there? Well, we think the battery business, the way we've seen it is, it was a necessary requirement for them to achieve anywhere even near their volume goals. Um, we, don't, we think that they understandably wanted to secure their own reliable supply of high quality batteries that, uh, would, uh, that they could have control over the cooling system and, and mitigate any risk of fire or other, other problems. Uh, and so they kind of needed to do that themselves. Whether the battery business becomes a separate business all its own, we've done some work with Stephen Bird and our electric utilities team of some of the market opportunities for, for stationary storage. You know, we can come up with uh, a few percent of the value of the company, but 
on a market cap of 42 billion, Corey, even bullish assumptions for Tesla Energy, it's still just, a, it's still a transportation company. Those other ones are more rounding errors right now. So where are you in terms of cash burn? What do you expect it to be? Because I, I was surprised that the, the recent stock offering wasn't bigger because it seems like they're gonna need a lot more cash just to get through this year. Um, so we have them, you know, they're targeting around uh, two, two and a half billion of CapEx in the first half of the year. Uh, if you put anything kind of call it two and a half to three billion of CapEx for the whole year, uh, I think on most people's models, the company's going to be burning somewhere between one, maybe two billion of cash this year. Now, they started the year at over three billion gross liquidity uh, of cash. So um, I, I, on our model, we still end up with even pre-cap raise around a billion, maybe within a billion post-cap raise, you can add to that number. So yes, on paper, they can do it, uh, but it's, and it gives them a bit more breathing room. Uh, but yeah, I'd say almost anybody with, a, with a, a, a model on Tesla has them burning cash this year and probably next year. And we have them burning cash even into 2019 a little bit. So uh, you've, so. you've got a bullish price of the stock. The, the tone of your voice suggests that maybe you think these guys have got a lot of proving to do. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think the Model 3 itself, and we point out to our clients at Morgan Stanley, um, uh, e even doing uh, a handful of Model 3s this year, the proving point is, isn't is going to be 0 to 60 in two seconds. Or I mean, that's, that's probably easy for them to do. Um, it's going to be safety. We think this year, Corey, right. it's all about safety. Can those initial cars, you know, whether they're independently tested or tested by Tesla, uh, are they really 10 times safer? Okay, by putting that liquid cooled supercomputer in the vehicles. And if that, if that happens, uh, I think that a lot of other members of the automotive ecosystem are gonna really, really take up and notice. And we also think it's gonna affect the used car market because the average car on the road, right. you know, in the US is 11 and a half years old, has some of them have tape decks, uh, practically no software. And if this vehicle really, really works with a steering wheel, um, we're going to have a used car problem that can affect the asset-backed securitization mark, the FinCos, the rental car right, companies. Right, right. There's all sorts of interesting things that could happen at that point. I guess one more question. Elon Musk news today that he's looking at starting a third company. He's already got, not including Solar City, he's already got two companies. Would you rather have a full-time CEO at this company? Do you wish Elon Musk or someone was running this company round the clock, not just part-time? In an ideal world, we could uh, we could clone Elon Musk and have. Well, we uh, can't. Since we can't, uh, <laughs> unless unless that's the company he's starting, you tell me. Uh, cloning, but uh, seriously, in an ideal world, sure. Uh, having uh, very talented uh, management leadership. We never have a good good enough leaders in any organization, right, um, to devote enough time to it. And, and I, I do believe it is true. He might be spending even more time at SpaceX than Tesla. Depends on the week. You could ask him yourself about that. Um, up to yeah. this point, okay, uh, it, it has not stopped his ability to make a car that every other auto company that we talk to has an enormous amount of respect for. So. The proof is in the pudding, and I think to, to your point of the risk of that question, the next nine months are going are gonna to tell us a lot. Adam Jonas, Morgan Stanley Analyst, really glad to have you on. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. All right, same with Elon Musk's company. As I mentioned, SpaceX, uh, one of his companies, is going to make history this week. It's slated, or it's trying to at least. We'll see. They're going to try to relaunch this Falcon 9 rocket seen last on April 8th of last year. SpaceX uh, went on to land it in a floating barge in the Atlantic Ocean and to try to recycle it and send it to space one more time again. That day could be this Wednesday or maybe Thursday now, reporter Dana Hall covers all things Elon Musk for us and joins us with more. Dana, uh, Dana sorry, uh, talk to me about this rocket. This is, this is really the proof of the pudding here, right? Yeah, so this is sort of what some people are calling SpaceX's Wright Brothers moment. This is a rocket that, you know, they flew it to space, they landed it on a drone ship last year, then they spent about four months refurbishing it, checking out all the engines. Now they're going to try to refly it again, and the latest I've heard is that the launch is slated for late Thursday from Cape Canaveral. Uh, is it weather? I was actually down that way this week. It looks like the skies are pretty clear. Yeah, I mean, there's always a risk of weather, um, and, and you know, and you have to get clearance from the Air Force to fly, and you know, sometimes people in luxury boats are trying to be looky loos, and so I mean, launch dates always slip. Um, but the latest is that it's slated for late Thursday, so we'll just have to see how the weather holds. Do we have any idea if I mean, the, the notion is that this will ultimately be cheaper, but do we have any notion of how expensive these launches are, and if the reusable rocket actually saves a lot of money? 
Well, it's interesting. Neither SpaceX nor the customer, which is SES, the communication satellite company out of Luxembourg, have said what the price is. But the CTO of SES did tell me that they got a cheaper launch for being first in line, for being longtime customers, kind of willing to go first. We know from SpaceX's website that a typical launch is roughly $62 million, but there's a discount if you buy you know, launches in bulk. And for a recycled rocket, it should be should be cheaper. I would love to know exactly what the price is. Uh, no one has disclosed that. If you want to let me know, let me know. But, um, <laughs> you know, ultimately, the goal is to really reduce the cost, not just for SpaceX's customers, but for SpaceX itself. I mean, they want to send people to Mars. In order to do that, you've got to be able to kind of fly a rocket, turn it around, bring it home, and fly it again. So this well, is really the first yeah. step towards that ultimate goal. And it's interesting because, you know, the Falcon 9 isn't, uh, uh, it is rocket science, but it isn't the most uh, advanced cutting edge rocket in, 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 the, in the world's fleet, right? Well, no one else has reflown a rocket before. Right. I mean, what the, what happened with the space shuttle was different. If they're able to do this, on, pull this off this week, fly this to space, and then land it again, I mean, that'll be a big milestone. You know, every, everyone is talking about reusability. Bezos is talking about it. ULA is now talking about it, but no one's actually done it. So, you know, all last year was about can they recover the rocket? Can they hit this drone ship landing? Can they land it on land? They've now done that eight times: three by land, five by sea. So, so now they have to prove that these rockets are reflyable. And, you know, the, the analogy that people always use is 747s. You and I can fly from San Francisco to New York. The plane lands, the crew cleans it up, they refuel it, and then it flies back to the West Coast. That's ultimately the goal for rocketry. But we're talking about some pretty serious thermodynamic events that go on when a rocket goes into space. And so it'll be interesting to see, you know, how does the engine do? How do the engines yeah. do? And how many times can you refly it? Like, what's the... What's the lifespan of a rocket once it's reused? All Can new they stuff. It? All new yeah. stuff is going to be fascinating to watch. Bloomberg reporter Dana Hall, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Right. Up next, robots brave paper cuts. So you don't have to. We're going to look under the hood of the machinery that's ramping up office productivity next. This is Bloomberg. A Silicon Valley startup called Ripcord has created a machine that takes stacks of paper, pulls out the staples, rapidly scans a paper, and scans it into the cloud. Bloomberg technology reporter Ian King tries to keep up. People need to have better jobs. We're not replacing people with machines. We're giving people much more interesting things to do. So I don't think anybody went to college to become a human staple remover. Silicon Valley startup Ripcord thinks they're about to overturn a $25 billion industry, the less than glamorous business of storing paper files. There's about 5 billion of these boxes filled with paper just in the United States. No one knows what's in that paper. Is it the cure for cancer? Is it the holy grail? Is it somebody's missing tax form? In this high-tech age, turning all that paper into digital bits relies on very low-tech human labor. You have to unload every file, name the folders, remove the staples. A standard banker's box, six hours of work. Six to eight hours, actually. So I asked myself, of all the world's problems, is sorting paper and scanning it really that difficult? I'm gonna blast through this box. <laughs> now the staple remover's broken. Scan. Go. Okay, this is jammed. Yeah, it's harder than it looks. Ripcord's answer to this problem is a giant machine loaded with robotics and artificial intelligence. Now we're going to use this machine to do it the easy way, to do it the fast way, right? We don't care if there's staples in there, which is what you were searching for before. We put some sheets in, and that's it for that folder. Just drop it in there. Okay, simple as that. That's it. Once the tray is loaded with paper, it's ready to go, so just press the green button. Press the green button. Once they're driven into our robotic work cell, it separates all of those packets of paper, looks for uh, each fastener using a vision system, removes them, and moves them one sheet at a time at high speed into our imaging unit, which actually scans them and places them into the cloud. The company's desire to protect their patents kept our camera from having a peek under the hood, but I was able to sneak a look. Ripcord's machines are not for sale. They offer their digitizing service for a fee and plan to have over 100 machines up and running in their first large facility very soon. Their main competitors are real estate companies who might be looking for new tenants once Ripcord has eaten all of their papers. 
That was Bloomberg Technology reporter Ian King, and that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Don't miss tomorrow. We've got the Bill Nye the Science Guy, the CEO of Planetary, right here on Bloomberg Tech.